Mike Swider, welcome to Sports Spectrum, sir. How you doing? I'm doing great, Jason. Great to be here, my friend. It's great to have you. When I went and looked at your resume, uh, 42 years coaching, 67 years old, and then I look at you, I think <laughs> I'm 48. I, I want to look like you look when I'm 67, my friend. Well, I'll tell you, one of the reasons you got to do is you got to marry a girl 12 years younger than you. <laughs> I, <laughs> you I, young, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I got married. I was 35. My wife was 23. And so, um, you know, she keeps me young, keeps me active, keeps me on my toes. And, and uh, that's been that's been that's been a lot of fun. I, I say this all the time. When you're 35 and you marry a, a 23 year old, you're the man. I said when you're 67 and she's 55, you're not the man anymore. No, she, <laughs> you're just, you're just hanging woman. on. <laughs> I'm just hanging on now. That's amazing. Well, listen, we were going to talk about, uh, you know, the fact that you've been out of coaching since 2019 and you coached for so many years and had so many great um, just great moments at Wheaton. Yeah. But you're still coaching again. In fact, we were talking beforehand that you're currently coaching. I'll let you explain that. And we'll, then we'll kind of fill in the blank and tell the, fill in the blanks and tell the entire story. Yeah, you bet, Jason. Um, yeah, I retired in, in 2019. I had coached uh, seven years at a, at a high school in Atlanta, Georgia, Westminster. Uh, I graduated from Wheaton in 1977. And then I went to Indiana University and got my master's there. And uh, that was a year. And then in the fall of 78, I went down to Atlanta and coached football, wrestling, and baseball down there. We won a, in fact, my first year down there coaching football, we won a state title in 1978. And then I was there through 84. And then in the spring of 85, I returned to Wheaton and was there 35 years. So if you add that up, it's the 42. And, yeah. and so then I retired in 2000, right? I, literally, my last day of work was like two weeks before the country shut down with COVID. Wow. So it really was, yeah, it really was a blessing for me. I, I would have gone out of my mind if I had all my meetings on, on Zoom like this. I, it, it, this is this is new to me. This is, I mean, I do it, but it's it's not it's not natural. I, I'd much rather be face to face, and not that this isn't good, but anyhow, that 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 happened, and so I've been out two years, and but I knew I didn't want to give up coaching, Jason. I knew I did it. I just wanted to give up all the the details of it that sometimes can grind you. And so, you know, when I went into coaching at age 23, I went into it because I wanted to inspire kids and challenge kids and be a mentor to them and influence them through the game of football. I've always said that football is the greatest microcosm of life. And in no other sport are so many people required to die to themselves mm. and live for a greater cause. It's the greatest sport, not because the sport inherently is better. It's just the numbers make it the greatest sport. You you got to get a lot of people who are willing to submit themselves to something that's bigger than themselves. And that's countercultural. And so I said, man, this is a great opportunity. So I went into coaching to, for that purpose. And, um, and, and what happens though, is when you coach that long, you develop a program, become the head coach and you're at a college level, everything consumes you, all these other things, recruiting and fundraising and, you know, dealing with the NCAA and administration and all these things they end up stealing all your time and the volume of time you spent actually doing what you love to do starts to shrink. Well, now, you know what I do? I show up at the high school where my son is. I show up there. I spend about 30 minutes in the office with him, getting him ready for practice, getting ready, coach three hours on the field, tell the players I'll spend 30 minutes watching tape afterwards. And I go home and I leave all the issues to my son. <laughs> So I get all the best of it, and uh, I get to hang out with my son three or four hours a day and, and not steal his personal life, and then I get to coach kids, and uh, I get to hang out with 14 to 18-year-olds, and that also keeps me young as well. So God has blessed me more than I deserve, Jason, in a great way, and it's been a lot of fun. Okay, so two questions off that. Yeah. Coaching your son, what is that like? And coaching 14 to 18-year-olds as opposed to 18 to 22-year-olds. Biggest yeah. difference. Yeah, coaching with my son. I, I coached Justin, in fact. I coached Justin at Wheaton College. So I actually coached Justin. You had that uh, experience, yeah. Yeah, as a, as a college student, I coached my second son, Michael, who is now currently full-time at Wheaton College. But I coached Justin there. Now I coach alongside him. And uh, it, it's a little different um, because now I sort of submit myself to him. You know, he calls the shots. He's a defensive coordinator. I'm more of a mentor. Yeah. Uh, I'm up in the press box. I'm not down on the field. So he's down on the field making all the calls, but he's 
you know, he's in contact. He says, Dad, what do you see? What's going on? You know, what kind of formations are they coming out? What do they do? Where are their tendencies? What? Give me some options. Give me some suggestions. But he calls the shot, but I'm, I'm the sounding board for him. And uh, I, I sort of respond to his lead. And, and that's been a lot of fun for me just to see him and help him grow. And, uh, and so that's been, that's been great. And, and, and I watched him uh, as, a, as a player as I was actually coaching him. And, and, and so one of the things, a little side note here, I remember when he came to Wheaton to play for me, he goes, he says, uh, uh, Dad, when, when, when I come to Wheaton to play for you, should I call you a coach or can I call you a dad? Hmm. And I said, well, when you're on the field, you call me coach, but in the office, you can call me dad. So then I went over to Wheaton Academy and he goes to coach with him. He says, well, what should I call you? I said, well, same thing. When you're in the office, call me dad. We're on the field. You call me coach. <laughs> <laughs> and so it really didn't change that. But well, do you have the- to call him coach or do you call him son? <laughs> I, I well, that's a great question. I call him son and Justin in the office, but I call him coach in the field. So the dynamics, the, the dynamics are the same, Jason. But uh, the difference, the, the answer to your other question, that the uh, the difference in fourteen to eighteen and eighteen to twenty two year olds um, in college, you 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 have these kids, but they come into your office throughout the day. You see them at night. You actually recruited them and chose them and selected them rather than them showing up. And so you, you were in their home. I was in their home with their parent. I was in Dallas, Texas, recruiting this kid. Or I was in San Diego recruiting that kid, or I was in Orlando. And so you have a relationship that began prior to them coming. And, and you have a relationship that's a little deeper because of the volume of time that you can spend with them. And consequently, sometimes they're their questions and uh, the the questions go deeper than just football questions, so to speak. That doesn't mean that that eliminates those from the high school, but the 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 volume of of mentoring and the and the depth of that is probably a little greater at the college level. Not because I want it to be that way, but because of circumstance and time. And the other thing, I'm not in the building, so to speak. And the other thing, I probably don't have the relationship with the, their parent like I had with the college kid because I was actually in his home and the parent entrusted me with their son in, on a personal level. Um, so that makes it a little different. Yeah, obviously on the field, uh, what the young man, he's, he's four years more mature. He's got higher testosterone levels. Right. You know, I mean, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster, he's more capable. Uh, that changes the dynamic. And the other thing that I would tell you that is they're, it's more important to them at the college because they're still playing. They're, it's, it's more than just an activity, an extracurricular activity to them. None of this is better or worse, but it's more, this is, it, it's, there's more serious about it. There's a level of seriousness an investment that's a little different than the, than the high school young man. Yeah, that makes complete sense. You mentioned recruiting, going to Dallas, going to California. Yeah. What was recruiting like? Because you're a D3 school, no scholarships yeah. to offer, but you still want to get people to buy into the program, to buy in what you have, but yet you can't really offer right. uh, you know, a Great scholarship. Question. You're offering you're offering an experience, if you will, or an opportunity to go through a program. What was that like kind of getting kids? Because I'm sure you recruited kids who may have been looked at by D2 or D1 schools. What was that no like? No question. First of all, it, it, we're, we were a top 10 D3 school uh, virtually every year, top 10, top 15 school, nationally ranked, you know, in the playoffs. And I would tell you this, those top level division three schools, their athletes aren't typical division three athletes. Right. They're really right. not. These are athletes that were marginal division one kids, division two kids. The, the, you look at the Mary Harden Baylors, the Mount Unions, the North Centrals, the Wheatons, those lots are littered, littered with kids that could have played at a higher level. Uh, those top 10 or 15 Division three schools can play. Now, I'm not saying you can compete with the SEC. And I'm not, I'm, trust me, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not delusional here. But sure. you are right. Those kids are capable of playing at, at bigger schools. But here's the thing that made Wheaton special. And when I recruited and, and I was – first of all, we were the – 
Wheaton is the only school in America that has every state and union represented on its campus. There is no school in America that had 50 states. We only had 2,100 students. Every state in the union was represented within our student body. Here's the reason why. If you wanted an Ivy League-like education, okay, a high, high high-end academic education where you could go to medical school, law school, seminary, you want to teach, you want to coach, you want to be an engineer, you know, if you wanted a high-end education, but you wanted to do it in a conservative, Christ-centered community, being taught by professors and coached by coaches who were born again, you want to be encouraged and pushed to the cross by your authority. You wanted to live with peers that would push you to the cross. Then Wheaton's your only choice. Right. I mean, it was, you had a niche. And so I said all the time, we, we, I didn't sell my facilities. You go to Notre Dame playing better facilities. I didn't sell that you could play on national TV. You know what I sold? I sold these kids, you can play in a competitive football program, play meaningful games in November, get a degree that's going to get you into Harvard Medical School. But more importantly than all that, you will exit exit college loving Jesus. And you will exit college with a greater and a deeper understanding of your faith and a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Hmm. And that's why I was able to go to Dallas, Texas, San Diego, I've been to Hawaii, I've been to Orlando, Florida, and I could get that kid to exit his home, spend more money, because you know what his parents and he wanted? He wanted the answer to a coach that would push him to the cross, and he wanted an answer to a roommate that would push him to the cross, and not compromise winning, and not compromise his degree. And that's how we did it. And, um, and that's how I built the program. I told the coaches, I said, don't soft sell the Christian community. Mm. Don't try to say, well, you know, you, you, and, and for fear, you're going to lose a kid because it's too conservative. I said, that's your calling card. And we're going to get kids that would never come to Wheaton if we don't soft sell this. This is who we are. There's a sign for Christ and his kingdom on the front of our campus. Sell it, man, and live it. And we'll get kids we have no right getting. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened for 35 years. And that's why we, you know, my son said, you won 209 games, Dan, you lost only 50. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pushing players to the cross and not just pushing them across the end zone. Exactly. Because that's what they're going to take when they leave. I just had a retirement. They, they gave me, finally, COVID bashed all my retirement celebrations. <laughs> and uh, yeah. but finally, last October, they, they were able to get one together. Well, I mean, it was, it, I, I'll tell you, Jason, it, it, it brought tears to my eyes. I, I, I told my wife I could, when I walked home, it started at like six o'clock and we were left at three in the morning. And I, I walked home. I said, I could, Jesus could take me home right now. Wow. I said, I heard things that most people only, they, they never hear them because they're only said at funerals. I said, I heard them now. Yeah. And you know what you, you know what you realize that the wins and loss, none of that mattered. You know what? You were a person of influence. And, and I told the players, I said, you leave someone money, Jason, they just spend it. You leave them wins and losses or achievement, they forget it. Mm-hmm. But what you leave in somebody transcends your life. And mm-hmm. that's how you influence culture. And I realized that I had left something in somebody and it had transcended and will transcend my life generationally. That's beautiful. Mike, why was uh, 2019 the time to call it quits? Yeah. Me. Why great, was that? Great why, question. why was that the time? Well, I was 65. I could go on Medicare. <laughs> yeah, but you don't look it, Mike, right? You don't <laughs> yeah. Well, I always said I was 65. And, and one of the things is I, I, I said to my, I could have coached long. My son, I met a staff, literally Wheaton Academy. The, the staff is all former players of mine. Wheaton Academy is a Christian high school. And so literally I'm not only my son, but the head coach is a guy that played for me in the early nineties. Wow. You know, the, the defensive line coach played for me in early 2000. You know, the wide receiver coach was Johnny Musso's son, you know, who played with the, the Italian Stallion. They were Alabama in the early 70s. His son, Brian Musso, or Brad Musso. So the, the whole staff is former players of mine. And so, um, and they said, Coach, man, you're no different. You were 30 years ago. You got as much energy. You, got as, you haven't changed one bit. 
And so I didn't, it wasn't I quit coaching because I didn't have the energy and the passion. There, there are a couple of reasons. One, I said, you got, you got about from 65 to 75 when you can still do some stuff. You, you're, you know, 75, you know, no matter how young I think I am, I'm going to start slowing down. Sure. I didn't want to burn those years. And I have a young wife who she loves the bike. She loves to go out and camp and, and do things. And I said, if I'm going to keep up with her, it ain't going to be from 75 to 85. Yeah. And so that was one reason. Um, and then another reason was I wanted to coach with one of my sons. I, I literally wanted to do that. I didn't want to do it from 75 to 85. I wanted to do it when I was younger. And then another thing that I think it's something to do with, I know my second son, Mike Jr., he wanted to, he, he was at Wheaton Academy with my oldest son. So I was able to watch my two sons coach together. Well, my last five years at Wheaton, but then my second son, Mike Jr. said, you know, I want to coach in the college. I'd like to coach at Wheaton. My oldest son wanted to stay at the Academy. And I said, you know, probably not good that I coach with him. That's not, not fair to him. He's got a it, too big a shadow, too big a shadow. If he's on the same staff with me with the same name. He, he's got to establish himself. I said, I need to exit here. And, and then he can join the staff. And so that's what happened. I, I retired. And within a couple of months, he joined the staff, not as a head coach, obviously. And, and so he is now, but he has my same phone extension. He still gets calls. Hey, coach Mike, how are you? And he goes, which coach Mike do you want here? <laughs> so now he's, 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 he's paving his own pathway there at Wheaton college. And I was able to coach now with my son and I'm still young, mm. you know, relatively speaking. And I can go over to watch my son coach week college. I can coach alongside my son at Wheaton Academy. I can go cycling and running with my wife. And I got 65 to 75 to do that before I really start to fade away. Mm. So that, that besides Medicare was the motivation. Mike Swider is our guest here on sports spectrum. Um, tell me about who Jesus is to you. Yeah. Wow. That's a great, great thing. Uh, Jesus is my pathway to heaven. Um, Jason, as you well know, uh, we all are born to sin since Adam and Eve, we all choose sin. We choose it. If I, without Jesus, I choose sin 100% of the time. Yeah. I would never make a decision without Jesus. I would never make a decision that wasn't sinful. And I still do sometimes, but Jesus is my only shot. And what happened was, is because we sin, there's a penalty for sin. The penalty is, is death. But God sent his son, Jesus, into the world and said, you know what? He's going to take your place on that cross. He's going to be your penalty for death. He's going to pay your penalty. All you got to do is accept him as replacement. It's like I'm headed to death row and I can pick out someone to say, you go to death row for me. And I have an option. And so I chose Jesus. Mm. And not only did I chose the, Jesus to go to death row for me, I now, because I chose that, I have a relationship with God. I have a statement that I use as our coaches, Jason. It says, rules without a relationship equals rebellion. Mm. Rules or demands without a relationship equals rebellion. Rules or demands with a relationship equals response. If you take the time to develop a relationship with somebody, they will respond to you. If you have no relationship, they will rebel. I say this to parents when I speak all the time. Kids do not rebel against parents. They rebel against the lack of a relationship. Kids don't rebel against demands. They rebel against a lack of relationship. Why is it that some kids respond to parents that put enormous demands on them and other kids rebel against a parent that puts few demands on them. It's always a lack of a relationship that, and I say that to our coaches, don't underestimate the time you spend developing a relationship with a kid. Cause that kid's going to play for you. If he knows, I always say this, it, it, they got to know you care before they care what you know. Yes. And so that's what God, that's why God sent Jesus, Jason. It was God, Jehovah in the old Testament. And if you look at the history of Israel and it was this rebellion. If you look at the Old Testament, they obeyed and then they rebelled and they rebelled. And God said, there's got to be a better way. And so he sent Jesus. If you looked in the Old Testament, it was the only way the Israelites talked to God was through a high priest. He killed the lamb and the high priest talked to God. And, and he said, I'm going to send Jesus. 
And here's the difference. Now you and I can talk to God anytime we want. Yeah. The more we talk to God, Jason, the better our relationship is, isn't it? It is. So you know what? Talk to Him. The worse the relationship is. Exactly. And the more better the relationship, you know what it is? The more obedient we become. Yeah. And so the world looks at it. Well, you have to live like that. You know what I said? No, I want to live like this because of this relationship with my authority. And so a player would come into my office and he would, he, he would wander. He got in trouble. He'd walk in my office, Jason. And I would ask him, son, grade your relationship right now with Jesus, A, B, C, or D. Invariably, he would say, D. I said, you've been in church on Sunday? Nope. Are you attending your small group regularly? Nope. Are you reading and praying daily? Nope. Are you serving? Nope. You're probably in a state of rebellion. I said, I tell our players, these things, if, if you're in church on Sunday, you're reading and praying daily, if you're in your small group on Wednesday, and if you're serving in an hour a week in some sort of capacity, your relationship is probably A. If it's A, you're probably not going to not be in a, in a place of rebellion. And so that's why Jesus in my life, first and foremost, he's a, he's a penalty so I get to heaven. I deserve hell and I get heaven, man. That's right. I deserve hell and I get heaven because I accepted that penalty. But the second thing, it affects the way I live. And the better my relationship with Jesus, the better I'm going to live. Because I need that in order to be responded. Yeah, I mean, you and I could spend <clears throat> another hour talking about, you know, <laughs> the impact of Christ on our lives and on the people who we love's lives. Um, I'll ask you a question here that might be a unique one. Yeah. For you, you work in, in a place where, you know, Christ is sort of, I don't want to say allowed, but he's glorified yeah, through the work. Absolutely. That you know what I mean? Encouraged, totally lot, encouraged, encouraged. A lot of people yeah. don't get that. Right. Um, I work at a place currently where Christ is encouraged, right? We bring Jesus into the conversation through this media ministry called sports spectrum. So you and I are in very similar boats with the work that we do, where we have people who are our counterparts who do similar work, but they aren't in a place where it's called ministry like we are. Right. Do you ever get, or did you ever get caught up so much into the idea of coaching, even though you're coaching for Christ, that that coaching became an idol? Yeah. That the work became an idol? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've said this many, many times that you have to keep perspective. When we lose perspective, I, I do a speech, I do a lot of motivational leadership talks now, a lot, a lot of groups. I've that's another thing I'm doing a lot of the speaking. I've been, I've got some messages that have resonated with businesses, with leadership groups, with, I do men's retreats, leadership conferences, a lot of that. But anyhow, one of the, one of the things I talk about is perspective is when we lose perspective is when we say we do things and become someone we don't like. Yeah. I'll never forget. I was coming home from a game once. And we had lost. We had just won, beat the best team in our conference. It was in the late 90s. And we had played, and we were, we were on our way to another conference title. And we got beat by a team that won one or two games. And it really cost us. And I'm on the coach bus because it was a relatively local team. And I'm coming home, and I'm going out of my mind. And I'm losing perspective. And I said, I'm ready to go home. And I'm ready to say something to my wife and to my three young kids that I don't mean. I know I'm, I'm losing perspective. This football has become this God. I mean, it's, it's, it's consuming me. And I said, I got to be careful here. And so, but I, I got home, got back to school. Obviously, I have to take care of things in the office, do some things. I finally was late Saturday night. I got home. And my oldest son, Justin, runs out of the house. And he said, hi, Daddy. You're the best. I love you. Mm. And you know what happened? I forgot all about the game. Right. Here's what you got to do. Jay. You got to keep perspective. And when you lose perspective, you got to, you got to count your blessings. And now here's what I say. Perspective is everyone's glass is half full and half empty. Are you focusing on what you have and you didn't deserve? Or are you focusing in on what you want and you didn't get? Where your focus is determines where your perspective is. If you're focusing on what you have and you don't deserve, heaven, my wife, my kids, a great job, a home, 
freedom to worship. When I focus on those things, football doesn't become an idol. When I focus on some of the things I want and I didn't get, a win, more money, then I start losing it. Yeah. Why is it, Jason, that the people whose glass is 10% full is are many times more happy than those that is 90% full? It's because of what they're looking at. Perspective. Those guys, are they're looking at the ones that is 10% full, Jason. They're looking at the 10% of things they have they don't deserve. The people who's 90% full are looking at the 10% they didn't get and they want. So they become bitter, angry, cynical, sarcastic, and vindictive. And that person who looks at the 10% that he has he doesn't deserve, beginning with heaven, that person isn't, it never gets like that. And so when you're in this, whether I was in the business world, whatever it is, to keep those things from becoming idols and changing your life, you got to keep perspective. And the first thing that helps me keep perspective is this. I deserve hell and I get heaven. Mm. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. I'm going to heaven someday and I will see my wife and kids for eternity. Don't let this other stuff cloud your vision. Yeah. It's humility. It sounds like that word should be, should be entered yeah. into the equation too, because you still want to be great. Oh, no doubt. Coach, right. You want to be a great coach at the same no time. No doubt. I'm not against being a, trust me, all of our players and everybody at Wheaton, they'll probably say it, it's toxic masculinity. Man, they, they, I'm going to say, I mean, I'm as driven. I'll tell you, I'm as type A and as driven as you can possibly be. Yeah. I've said this many times, you know, you and I go lay on a hot tar roof, you will get off before I do. We'll go up on that hot tar roof and lay off. And I said, okay, the winner lays tie. I said, you're going to lose because I, 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 ain't, I ain't getting off. <laughs> I'm as driven as anybody in the world is, but it's when that, that drive and that, and, and that's not wrong. It's when that becomes the thing that's all you focus is. Yes. Then you lose it, man. When your focus is just winning, when your focus in the business world is just when that's your entire primary focus, things you ultimately can't control, then you get goofed up. Yeah. Um, why is there a picture of Joe Namath behind you? <laughs> you see it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was when I was growing up, Joe Namath, he was not, it, it, it's people who say, well, man, you're a believer. How come it's Joe Namath? Oh, hey, I got pictures yeah. of people I rooted yeah. for too. Right? No, no, <laughs> Joe, I just, i tell you right now, I, I loved, I loved when he made the prediction. You know, I love, you know, that he was going to win that Super Bowl. I love the way he played. I love that confidence when he played. And here's the other thing. And this is the thing I loved about him the most and why I, I, Brett Favre was another one of my guys. Yes. Is because they weren't afraid to fail. You know, Joe Namath would throw three picks, and you know what? He tried to hammer the next one in there. He wasn't, nothing made him timid. Nothing made Brett Favre timid. And, and, and I've told my, my sons this, and in everything you do, when you're not afraid to fail, you will ultimately achieve. It's when you're afraid to commit, when you're afraid to step out of the boat, when you're afraid of the consequence or the result, you'll never get the result you want because you're afraid. And Joe, he could throw 10 picks. And you know what he'd do? He'd try to force the next one in there. <laughs> and I just love the confidence that he, he was never afraid to say, you know what? I can still do this. And my oldest son, Justin, and my second son, too, they're, they're a lot like that. They, they're, they're not afraid. I mean, they're, whatever it is, I can do it. I can do it. Sure. No problem. I can do that. And he might not be able to do it, but you didn't know that you can't do it until you tried to do it. <laughs> you just worked Joe Namath into a full sermon. Like, yeah. <laughs> See? it's not impossible. Yeah, there you go. But that's good. You saw that factor. Yeah. So I look at that and I go, you know, Mike, don't be afraid to fail. Well, don't be afraid you, to fail. I'm looking at your age. You just say you're 67. Seven. 67 I go 67 old. in May. 67 years old in May. So you're 13 when he goes and wins that yeah that championship yeah. in the in the greatest upset in you know Super Bowl yeah. history or one of the yeah. greatest upsets when the Jets beat the Colts in Super Bowl three. Yeah. 13 is the age I think the most influential age that people can really come into your life and, and make an impact. You know, no from doubt. a personal perspective and from a sport. I, I think about 13 year old Jason and Dale Strawberry from the New York Mets and, you know, Tony Dorsett from the Dallas Cowboys yeah. and Larry Bird from the Boston Celtics. Oh, yeah. Those were my guys at 13 yeah. years old. 
So 13 year old Mike, you see Joe Namath, you yeah. know, getting back up, throwing another pass. Yeah. Saying, you know, I'm gonna get with the bad there. knees, bad and knees. He, and then everything. I mean, come on, right? Yeah. You know, it made me go, you know what? If you really put your heart into this and you try and you attempt it, you're, you're, you, I always say this, you're not a failure until you quit trying. Yes. As long as you, you know, you're, you're not a loser until you quit. You know, losing doesn't make you a loser. Failing doesn't make you a failure. Quitting makes you a loser and quitting makes you a failure. And he just, so you keep throwing, you keep getting up. I, you know, I, I, you know, my dad was, he was a one of the, he was a World War II vet, part of that greatest generation. You know, that they're all dead or dying. My dad's gone now. And, you know, they grew up during the depression. So they had nothing. And then they all fought. My dad is 18 years old. He graduates from high school. Two weeks later, he signs up. And six months later, he's fighting. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, you know, they, they, they grew up having nothing. And they fought as if they'd been given everything. And different culture. But I remember my dad, I'd come home and I'd have a problem. I'd be whining about something and complaining and, and he'd just sit there and listen to me. You know, I didn't, wasn't playing enough, or I didn't get an A on the test or whatever. And I, I had failed or whatever. And he, he, and he said, are you done? He says, because when you're done, just tell me, but I'm just going to, you know, I, I wanted him to argue with me, you know, but he wasn't going to do that. So finally, see, I'm done whining. I'm done complaining. I'm telling you, he says, make sure you're done. He says, I'm done. And he'd look me in the eye and he goes, Mike, it looks like you got two choices. You either fight or you quit. What are you going to do? And he get up and walked out of the room. <laughs> that was his answer, Jason, yeah. to every problem that I ever came to him with. He didn't debate me. He didn't argue with me about maybe it was a legitimate problem. But he knew in his heart there was only one answer that would solve my problem or one thing that would cause it never to be solved. If it never was going to get solved, quit. If you wanted it solved, fight and that was his answer to everything and that's you know you, the Joe Namath thing keep throwing you know you, you quit throwing you're never gonna click lead another pass you know you, you you don't get up off the ground you're never gonna play again fight or quit answer the bell you know there uh, one other quick story you'll love this Jason is is uh, the former heavyweight boxing champion of the world was asked this was in the early 1900s there was no round limit to how many, to who won. It was just, you'd fight until someone didn't answer the bell or they got knocked out. Wow. And so they asked, they asked the heavyweight champion, he says, what does it take to win a championship? You know what he said? Fight one more round. Yeah. You fight one more round, eventually you win because the other guy will quit. Yeah. Granted that no one gets knocked out. And so ding, ding. And so that's what I would do with my players at Wheaton a lot of times. They come in with a problem. And they, I, had a, I had a slogan that says, answer the bell. So if a player would come into my office, he'd be complaining. Why? I said, you done? Yeah, I'm done. I say, ding, ding, walk out of the room. Answer the bell, man. Because if you don't answer that bell and show up tomorrow, you lose. You answer the bell, you got a shot. Mm. Answer the bell. Mike Swider, this has been a fantastic conversation. My last question for you, uh, and we'll have to get you back on and talk some more. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of stories here for sure that we could share. Um, Where are you right now with your faith as far as what God is teaching you? What's he showing yeah. you now in this stage of life that you're living, Mike Swider? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. One of the things that um, uh, it's always been tough, and I'm coming to a greater understanding of it now, is this idea of trust. I just read the book with my wife, Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. And you know, when you're type A like us and driven, driven, you know, you just, I can do this. I can, I just told you, I could lay on that hot tar roof longer than you. I can, but there's a lot of things in life you can't, you can't control. No matter how hard you work, no matter how long you lay on that hot tar roof, no matter how early you get up and how much late you go to bed, there's some things out of your control. And we don't live a life that trusts God, where we legitimately trust God for outcomes we're going to end up being very, very frustrated people. And at the end of the day, we ought to understand once we give our heart to Jesus, our day is, 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 is in his hands. And the outcome of that day is the outcome he wants. And you know what I'm really, really learning? Everything happens for our good and his glory. 
And I've got to learn that. And at age 67, even though I, I finished that, he said, you got to be kidding me. How come that happened? I mean, you got to be kidding. Why? That, that can't be good. Right. You know what? Everything, Jason, as believers, you know, we don't have to read the horoscope to find out whether what our day is going to be like. Our day has been set up and our day is going to end up for our good. When we go to bed at night, that day has been for our good and for his glory. And I got to learn to trust that. And at age 67, I'm still learning that. Yeah. Well, I think we never stop learning until the time that we actually go and yeah. meet our, our savior. Our so. maker. Yeah. That's right. Mike, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, this was fantastic to talk, uh, to talk all different sorts of topics with you and hopefully we'll get to do it again. I hope we can. You bet. Connected. You got it, Mike. You Thanks. bet. Absolutely. Jason, just give me a shot. We'll get back and we'll try to solve all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, buddy. You bet. God bless you, Jason.